Hey, do I? He just goes to the press tomorrow. So, in 1981, when Pei Due exploded into public notice, uh, they discovered there were 451 members of Pei Due in key positions in the Italian government, including the head of the secret police. When the police went to arrest Jelly, he had already left Italy and flown to Uruguay because the head of the secret police had tipped him off being a member of Pei Due himself. The head of the secret police was indicted for conspiring with GLA to overthrow the government, install a new fascist government, and in the course of this conspiracy, they performed, the investigating magistrates alleged, several terrorist bombings which they blamed on the Red Brigades to persuade the Italians there was a massive anarchist threat loose in the country and they needed a fascist government to protect them from it. The head of the secret police died before he could be brought to trial. He was a knight of Malta, so was Jelly. The Knights of Malta are an ancient Vatican uh, secret society devoted to trying to put things back to the way they were in the 13th century, more or less. The main purpose of the Knights of Malta is to correct the errors that have crept into the Western world since the rise of Protestantism. Uh, the Western world is full of people who do, not, who do not acknowledge the infallibility of the Pope. This is an error. Uh, the Western world is full of people who believe it's legitimate to overthrow an ordained monarch. This is an error. Uh, Pope Leo the, the Faulty findeth, as Joyce calls him. What, what, Leo, what Leo was, what number did he have? Oh, you know the bastard I mean. Uh, Leo in the 1870s, he wrote a syllabus of errors listing all the errors of the modern world. Most of them you'll find in the American Bill of Rights. These are all errors. Freedom of the press is an error. The press only has the freedom to print the truth, and the church defines the truth. The idea that we can print whatever we want is an error. Uh, the function of the Knights of Malta is to undo the Protestant Reformation, undo the democratic revolutions of the 18th century, and reestablish papal control over the whole world the way it should be, the way Jesus intended it to be when he founded the Catholic Church. <laughs> you all know Jesus founded the Catholic Church, right? <clears throat> so Jelly was a knight of Malta. The chief of the secret police was a knight of Malta. Within masonry, which the knights of Malta have been trying to abolish for 200 years, they founded this quasi-Masonic order called Pei Due. The... Uh, the next in line for chief of the secret police, after the, chief, the head of the secret police died, turned out to be a member of Pei Due also. He, he was brought to trial for conspiracy in the Bologna Railway bombing and acquitted. Uh, Jelly, uh, in the early 1970s, had recruited Roberto Calvi, who was... Uh, middle rank officer of Banco Brosiano, a bank owned by the Vatican Bank, but operating as a separate organization in Milan. Roberto Calvi believed that power in this world uh, is based on what the Italians call uh, see, uh, secret power. All open power is based on secret power that works behind the scenes. Calvi told this to everybody he ever got into a philosophical discussion with. He told it to his son, he told it to other workers at the bank. It was one of his favorite topics when he wasn't recommending The Godfather. Calvi always told everybody, there's only one novel you have to read. <laughs> read The Godfather. That's the book that shows the way the world is really run. The rest of it is all romantic nonsense. So Calvi had a deep passion to find out who held the secret power so he could join them and be on the winning side, which makes a lot of sense if you want to be on the winning uh, I'm always amazed by paranoids who find out who holds the power and then spend all their time fighting with them. If you know who holds the power, the thing to do is join them. If you're going to fight them, you're just going to wear yourself down, right? Doesn't that make sense? Or do we have some idealists left in the world? <laughs> well, Calvi joined uh, Propaganda Due and got to be president of Banco Ambrosiano. Nicola Sindona, who was a lawyer, for the mafia, for several mafia families in particular in Sicily. He joined Pei Due and got sent over to the United States where he offered Richard Nixon a million dollars for the 1972 campaign. 
which Nixon's people decided to decline because uh, they didn't like uh, the possibility of this being traced back to the mafia, whether they ever managed to give the million dollars to Nixon through some subterranean channel, I have been unable to discover. But Sindona was at Nixon's inauguration that year. Sindona founded the Franklin National Bank in this country, and uh, shortly thereafter was convicted of 65 counts of stock and currency fraud and faking his own kidnapping to avoid trial on those 65 counts. Then he hired, Nixon was out of office by then, he hired Nixon's law firm to fight his extradition to Italy, and they fought for a long time, seven or eight years, before Sindona was finally sent back to Italy, where he was convicted of murdering a bank examiner in connection with the failure of several of his banks over there, from which he had embezzled as much money as he, as he had embezzled from the Franklin National Bank over here. And then he was about to stand trial for conspiracy with Jelly and General uh, Michielli of the Secret Police and Michio Jelly uh, in this fascist conspiracy to overthrow the government of Italy. Before he could stand trial on that charge, he was poisoned in his cell. Roberto Calvi was indicted for embezzling from his own bank for laundering heroin money for the Grey Wolves and other groups in the Near East. But the Grey Wolves are especially interesting. They believe Allah, the Islamic God, has appointed them to destroy the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, Allah, uh, like many gods, is inscrutable. He says, go do this, and he doesn't tell you how. The Grey Wolves are a bunch of poor Palestinians with uh, not a pot to piss in, so to speak, or at least they were when they started out. How are they going to overthrow Israel? Well, they figured out how. They started dealing heroin. And pretty soon they had enough money to buy lots of guns. And then they found another source of money. They started renting out some of their leading, their most talented young men as assassins to other terrorist groups around Europe. And that made more money for them. Finally, one of them tried to shoot the Pope for reasons that have never been explained. It gets Byzantine, doesn't it? <laughs> this money was being laundered through the Banco Ambrosiano, which was owned by the Vatican Bank, which was managed by Archbishop Paul Marchinkus. Have you ever heard of Archbishop Paul Marchinkus before tonight? Isn't that amazing? Everybody in Europe has heard of Archbishop Paul by now. And in this country, he got into the headlines back in uh, the early 70s, when Frank Hogan, the district attorney of New York, tried to extradite him to the United States to stand trial. And the Vatican refused to let him be extradited. And there was a bit of a tussle over that. What Hogan wanted Marchinkus to stand trial for was Hogan had, uh, and his investigators, had discovered that the Rizzi family in New York and the Roselli family in Las Vegas uh, now, Johnny Roselli started out as a gunman for Al Capone, but he ended up running all mafia projects in the Las Vegas, Nevada area. Johnny Roselli was frequently accused of being in on the Kennedy assassination by various uh, amateurish and bungling conspiracy investigators <laughs> who aren't as smart as I am. Uh, I mean, by conspiracy investigators of the highest intelligence and integrity who arrived at different conclusions than me. Uh, Johnny Roselli and, uh, and the Rizzi family in New York printed a billion dollars in counterfeit stock and deposited them in the Vatican Bank, whereupon they disappeared. The Vatican Bank is the financial equivalent of a black hole. <laughs> uh, you know, a black hole, nothing ever gets out of, not even light. Even light can't escape from a black hole. Well, nobody knows what's going on in the Vatican Bank except the people who run it because the Italian bank examiners can't get in. Uh, the Vatican is not part of Italy. It's a sovereign state. That's why Noriega could take refuge in the Vatican embassy. It's a sovereign state. They have embassies just like any other government. They're not only a church, they're a government too. So nobody can get into the Vatican Bank. So once something gets into the Vatican Bank, it disappears from profane view, and only God and Archbishop Marchinkus know what becomes of it. So $1 billion of counterfeit stock went into the Vatican Bank and was seen no more. Now, letters were produced in which Archbishop Marchinkus is corresponding with Johnny Roselli about getting this billion dollars in counterfeit stock. 
Now, the defenders of the good archbishop, of whom you'll find quite a few among pious Roman Catholics, who don't want to believe that an archbishop would be engaged in knowingly dealing in counterfeit stocks, they claim he thought he was buying real stocks. He didn't know the mafia prints counterfeit stocks. Well, that's possible. He could, maybe he thought he was dealing in baby booties, and they never explained that. We got a billion. But if he thought he was buying real stocks, it's very strange that he paid only one tenth of the face value, because that's the going price for counterfeit stocks. <coughs> one tenth of the face value. Uh, counterfeit stocks travel around the world uh, faster and faster all the time, going in more directions. It's very much like quantum theory. You can never know where they are. You just know they've been here, and now they're going to be there. You never know where they are. Uh, if you have a business that's in trouble and you buy counterfeits, you buy enough counterfeit stocks, let's say you can be, you got enough capital to, uh, let's say, just a million dollars. So you got a million dollars and you have debts of three million dollars and they're all, boy, the sheriff is at the door, your business might go bankrupt any day. So you take your million dollars and buy ten million dollars worth of counterfeit stocks. You deposit the $10 million of counterfeit stocks into your bank. You've now got a $10 million line of credit. You pay off everybody you owe money to. You're not in trouble anymore. You expand your business. You hire new people. You buy, build new plants. And then you sell the stock to somebody else equally desperate. <coughs> and if the, if the stock be moving fast enough, they don't get caught. The stocks that get caught are not counterfeit stocks by and large. It's stolen stocks that are, uh, banks are apt to notice. Counterfeit stocks, they sometimes notice, but if they move fast enough, the banks don't look at them that closely, and so they keep traveling. So this billion dollars in counterfeit stocks went into the Vatican Bank, and God knows where it went after that. The banks started <coughs> collapsing all over the world. Wall Street almost collapsed with this continuous uh, turmoil in the international economic community. Because $10 billion in counterfeit stocks is more goddamn counterfeit stocks than have ever been loose at any one time before. Well, uh, District Attorney Hogan did not manage to extradite Marchinkus. Nixon intervened to protect Marchinkus. Uh, uh, there's an implication that Nixon was afraid of losing the Catholic vote. I don't know. Uh, Nixon also had uh, Sedona as a guest at his inauguration, so one feels there was a closer connection than just the Catholic vote. Um, in 1981, the district attorney of Dade County uh, indicted eight officers of the Royal Finance Corporation in Miami uh, for operating, he said, knowingly operating the largest cocaine laundromat ever uncovered. Uh, he the DA got interested in the, this bank, the World Finance Corporation, because garbage men had told the police that they kept finding marijuana stems in the garbage. No, no, not stems, the, 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 the stalks, the stalks that you break the stems off before you take the leaves off the stems, you know. They had great big marijuana stalks in the garbage all the time. And uh, these garbage men apparently weren't pot smokers themselves, well, they would have kept their mouth shut and just went into the bank and said, can we buy some? You know? <laughs> and they went and told the police, and the police told the DA, and they put the bank under surveillance, and they very soon discovered that people were coming from Panama every day with uh, briefcases full of cash. Panama is the only country in the world that uses American dollars outside America as its currency. These people are coming in every day with briefcases full of money, not, not checks, cash. And this bank was running it all through the Cisalpine Bank in the Bahamas. And so the district attorney started investigating the Cisalpine Bank in the Bahamas. And guess who owned the Cisalpine Bank in the Bahamas? Archbishop Marchinkus and Roberto Calvi. And the money went from the Cisalpine Bank to the Vatican Bank, <laughs> along with all the heroin money from the Grey Wolves and the Catholic Church was getting richer all the time. And some of the money was going to Poland to support solidarity, which made the CIA very happy. Uh, a lot of the money found its way back to Central America to support the death squads that the CIA is running because the Senate Intelligence Committee, from the time Jimmy Carter got in in 1976, until uh, Reagan got in in 1980, the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, was 
getting a lot of cooperation from Stanfield Turner, who was the head of the CIA at that time, disapproved of the CIA's involvement with the drug business and fired over 400 agents for being involved in the drug business. And the Senate Intelligence Committee was learning a great deal about the CIA's involvement in the drug business. So the CIA fired all these people, who thereupon went into the drug business in a much bigger way than ever before. And Theodore Shackley, who was running all this, was dispatched by them, according to the Christic Institute, who has doc which has documents, he was dispatched by them to persuade George Bush, who had been the supervisor of the whole project, to run for president. So if they could get Bush into the White House, they could go back into business as they were doing it before, inside the government instead of outside the government, and thereby have greater protection. Well, Bush did not win the presidency. He only got the vice presidency. But Reagan made him the head of the National Security Agency, which gave him oversight over the CIA. So they were all soon back in business again, which is why in 1981 they had this bank with eight CIA agents running it in Miami. And I was wondering, all this cocaine money to pay for the death squads, which Congress wasn't supposed to know anything about, and which most Americans still don't know anything about even today. You say death squads to most people, and they say, oh, yo, you mean the Nazis in, second, in the Second World War, something like that? No, we, I mean death squads right now all over Latin America, killing anybody who objects to American domination. They come into villages at night, they shoot people at random to terrorize the whole village. This is being paid for by the drug business. I'm sorry if you like cocaine, this may make you feel a bit queasy about it, but uh, I told you you wouldn't find this part as funny as the first part. I'm telling you occult secrets. These are things that are hidden that the profane do not know about, that are not revealed in the mass media. The uh, World Finance Corporation was run by Hernandez Cataya, who was one of the people, along with Howard Hunt, who had masterminded the Bay of Pigs invasion. Now, in the Watergate tapes, don't they sound like Mae Russell? <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the Watergate tapes, you find that Howard Hunt demanded a million dollars. Among other things, he not only threatened to tell the truth about Watergate, but he said he'd reveal that whole Bay of Pigs thing. And, and Nixon says, oh, we can't let him talk about that Bay of Pigs thing. I'll get the million dollars. I know how to get a million dollars. Remember that part of the tapes? And does anybody remember? It was way back. It was 73. Does anybody remember that part back? <laughs> you, can, you, you can still see dramatizations of these tapes with Rip Torn playing Nixon <laughs> on television. Um, what Bay of Pigs thing was Nixon so worried about that he was willing to pay a million dollars? I thought all the Bay of Pigs secrets were out by 73. Apparently there was something that, they, that was still hidden in 73, and Nixon paid a million dollars to keep it covered up, and it hasn't come out yet. Hunt kept his mouth shut. Hunt's wife got the first payment of the million dollars, got on a plane, and the plane crashed just short of Chicago Airport, you may remember. The pilot was found to have an unusual concentration of cyanide in his blood, but the investigator who was appointed by Nixon, Nixon threw out the head of the FAA, which investigates such things, and put in somebody else, who announced, oh, it's normal for people to have that much science. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what they say, I swear, that's what they say. <laughs> when Ronald Reagan took office, Lichio Jelly was a guest at the inaugural party. Remember Lichio Jelly? He was the one who set up this whole uh, organization between the Knights of Malta, the CIA, and the cocaine business, and the death squads, and the Klaus Barbie and his old friends from the Gestapo. Uh, in 1944, before the invasion of Sicily, the OSS, the parent of the CIA, uh, went to uh, Lucky Luciano, who was serving a term for procuring procure or for running a prostitution ring or whatever the hell is the legal term for it. And they told Lucky Luciano, we'll get you out of prison early if you will send messages to your friends in the Sicilian Mafia to help the American troops in the invasion rather than opposing them. Luciano agreed. The invasion of Sicily went off very smoothly and quickly. 
and the American intelligence community found itself uh, married to the mafia from then on. They never did get untangled. After the war, they used the mafia to uh, attack the French labor unions in southern France, and then onward uh, through Licio Gelli, they went after the Italian labor unions and so on. And uh, it gets harder and harder as uh, they generate decades pass from the 1940s to the present. You can never say this was mafia or this was CIA. The two are so intertwined that all you can say is this was mafia and or CIA. On the other hand, William Casey, who died while under investigation in the Iran Contra, Wait a minute, that was General Musumichi. He died while under investigation in the Bologna Railway bombing. Oh, it happened to, it happened to William Casey, too. Uh, people under investigation often die suddenly. It's, uh, it's the stress of publicity, I guess. Uh, William Casey, like General Musumichi, was a knight of Malta. Just like Licio Gelli, who set this whole thing up. Just like Roberto Calvi, who ran the Banco Ambrosiano and the Cisalpine Bank with Archbishop Marchinkas. Roberto Calvi was found hanging from a bridge in London on June 18, 1982. Uh, Scotland Yard ruled that it was suicide. There was a lot of criticism in the English newspapers, and there was especially a hell of a lot of criticism of the fact that the, uh, Calvi was a Freemason, and the detective who investigated for Scotland Yard was a Freemason, too. And the Calvi was found hanging with a rising tide that covered his dead body. Now, the first degree oath in Freemasonry includes, or used to include, they changed it since Calvi's death, by the way. <laughs> it used to include, and if I ever betray my fellows in the craft, may I be hanged where the rising tide will cover my dead body. Which uh, pretty clearly indicates that Calvi was killed by his fellow Freemasons, or by somebody who ardently wishes us to think he was killed by his fellow <laughs> Freemasons. His wife claims he was killed by the Vatican. Uh, Clara Calvi has said consistently from the beginning, from the time Calvi was found hanging from the bridge, she still says, he told her, he called from London and said he was going to come back to Italy, surrender, turn state's evidence, and reveal the people in the Vatican who had hatched all these major crimes he was involved in. Generally, when you turn state's evidence on the crimes of that level, you get off, and the other people take the fall. And uh, he said he's afraid that the Vatican will try to kill him, but he thought he had enough on them that they wouldn't dare do it in public. That's sort of the way uh, General Noriega feels right now. They won't dare do it. Well, everybody knows I'm here in the prison. And, uh, anybody want to give odds that Noriega will survive two months? Two months. <laughs> two months? Three, how about three months? No. <laughs> uh, Calvi's son also says the Vatican ordered his death. Uh, there's another book written by two Italian journalists who claims the mafia killed Calvi because he sure changed them on one of the heroin deals. So there's more than one theory about Calvi. Now, the interesting thing is the Knights of Malta include Otto von Habsburg who's also a member of the Priory of Sion and the president of the Society for the United States of Europe and a direct descendant of Jesus Christ, if you believe the genealogies in Holy Blood, Holy Grail. <laughs> so maybe the earth is hollow after all. <laughs> in Costa Rica, there is a farm far, far away. And the farm belonged to a man named John Hull. How many people have ever heard of John Hull? Hey, hey, are we getting, are we getting to... <laughs> uh, John Hull is uh, an allegedly former CIA agent like the eight guys who were running the World Finance Corporation in Miami. The DA claimed he could prove they were all still CIA agents. The CIA claimed they were ex-CIA agents. It seems to me the distinction is very metaphysical. Uh, anybody, it's, uh, it's been, uh, since Fouché at least, it's been common practice in the intelligence business to fire somebody when you want them to do something so bad that you don't want to track back to the agency. So they get fired and they get paid through a numbered bank account in Switzerland and they go on working, but nobody can prove it. And the eight guys who were running the Royal Finance Corporation laundering all that cocaine money seem to be in that class. And uh, 
John Hull was probably in that class too. He had a huge farm in Costa Rica. The Costa Rican government has indicted him for using the farm to re illegally receive arms from Ali North transport the arms to the Contras in Nicaragua, pick up cocaine from the Contras, and ship the cocaine back to Miami. And uh, John Hull left Costa Rica as soon as they indicted him. He disappeared for a while. He was then reported in Miami. The Costa Rican government asked the American government to extradite him. The Justice Department replied that they couldn't find him. It turns out he's living on a ranch in Indiana. But the Justice Department still hasn't gotten around to extraditing him back to Costa Rica. Meanwhile, the Costa Rican government, after further investigation, has indicted John Hull for murder in the La Penca bombing, in which several journalists were killed trying to cover an interview, uh, a public statement by a guy who was on the side of the Sandinistas during the revolution against Somoza, decided he didn't like the Sandinista government, joined the Contras, decided he didn't like the Contras and started his own revolution. And he was going to make a statement denouncing the Contras as being a tool of the CIA when the bomb was set that killed several journalists. Uh, the Christic Institute claims to have enough evidence to prove that John Hull and his crowd at the ranch manufactured the bomb. And it was delivered by a CIA agent. The Costa Rican government believes it and they indicted Hull for the murder. Uh, the media in this country, for some reason, is not interested in John Hull at all. You've got to hunt and I don't know how the hell you people ever found out about John Hull. You've got to hunt and hunt to find stories about the Hull case. Uh, Hull was introduced to Ali North by Dan Quayle. <laughs> uh, this was in the LA uh, Times the day Hull was indicted for murder. And I thought, Dan Quayle? Now, where have I heard that name before? <laughs> I remember George Bush who was persuaded to run for president by Theodore Sheckley. Theodore Sheckley, who was running the Secord, Hakim, Cocaine, and Guns Cartel all those years after Jimmy Carter threw them out of the CIA. Uh, and Theodore Sheckley was running this whole goddamn Guns Cocaine thing. Uh, he, uh, wait a minute, I got so entangled with my grammar, I forgot where I was going. Um, well... He asked Bush to run for president. Yeah, Theodore Shockley asked Bush to run for president. Bush didn't make it the first time. The next time he ran for president, he said, look at who I select for vice president. That will tell you all about me. Now, you track Dan Quayle's record back, and he was, after he got out of the Indiana National Guard, there's a hell of a lot of evidence that while serving in Congress, he was also working for the CIA with the whole, and with the Shockley bunch outside the CIA. That's how we got to know John Hull when we introduced to Ali North. Now, if you look at Ali North in his testimony, you will notice that he has a, a certain interesting expression in his eyes. And if you think back, those of you who are old enough, you'll remember another leading figure in 20th century politics who had that kind of expression in his eyes. That was Adolf Hitler who was on cocaine almost continually from 1936 until he died. Adolf Hitler was the biggest coke freak in Europe. He was also taking steroids. And Hitler got more and more of that same look that Ali North has. <laughs> you know that, I know I'm God, but I'm going to try to pretend I'm not while I take advantage of these schmucks. Timothy <laughs> <laughs> Leary says, speaking as a scientific psychologist, the effect of cocaine is to make you an obnoxious asshole. <laughs> now, one of the most obnoxious assholes of the 20th century, Hitler and Ali Wood, right? <laughs> okay, acute cocaine psychosis. Uh, Fawn Hall has admitted in testimony to the DEA that she was using cocaine all the time she was working at the White House. Uh, she was dating one of the Contra leaders who was uh, bringing the cocaine up to Hull's ranch and dealing continually with Ali North. So when George Bush says, I'm going to show how bad the problem is, we'll go across the street and buy some cocaine, that's more <laughs> bullshit. All he had to do was walk down the hall and over the fucking White House. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to take another short break and then we have a question period and then I shoot like a bat out of hell to the San Francisco airport. Okay? Short break. <laughs> Uh, 
I, th I think, uh, well, George Washington said nations have no permanent allies, only permanent interests. Uh, mm -hmm. Conspiracies have no permanent allies, only permanent interests. Uh, Timothy Leary uh, said to me after reading Illuminatus, there are 24 conspiracies in every, every city, uh, every, every large social group. He says, when I was at Harvard, I saw there were 24 conspiracies fighting to take over Harvard. And when I was in Folsom, I saw there were 24 gangs trying to take over Folsom. The, the guards are only one gang. There's the Aryan Nation and uh, uh, the JDL, and there's all these other groups in there. And uh, curiously, that, that came up in a conversation with the former district attorney of Santa Barbara. He just spontaneously said uh, that he was talking about my books. He said, you know, in any city the size of, say, Santa Barbara, there are 24 groups fighting to take over the territory. <laughs> and uh, that's why I don't believe in monolithic conspiracy theories. There's one group that runs everything. If there was one group that runs everything, the world would make a little sense. <laughs> well, when you start examining what's going on, it doesn't make any sense at all. But uh, like H. L. Mencken said, and he believed he was a polytheist because the universe looks like it was designed by a committee. <laughs> the world looks like it's run by a committee in which everybody's fighting, everybody else is standing, everybody else in the back, and uh, and uh, that's from the multiple, the multiple conspiracy model. And it makes more sense to me than the idea that there are no conspiracies, which is nonsense because anybody who's ever worked for a corporation, those corporations conspire all the time, politicians conspire all the time, pot dealers conspire not to get caught by the narcs, the art world is full of conspiracies, conspiracy is natural primate behavior, but there is no one conspiracy smart enough to run everybody. If there was, the world would start to make sense. According to Colonel Tom Bearden, who is the most erudite, knowledgeable, and scientifically well-informed paranoid on the scene, uh, the Russians know how to alter reality. They know how to use the quantum equations to move from one parallel universe to another. And they're gradually moving us out of the universe we started into an entirely different universe. Now, if you want paranoid theories, try that one. <laughs> That's appearing all over the computer network, <coughs> right out of John Carpenter's film, They Live. The extraterrestrials are all around us, and the CIA allows them to genetically experiment on a certain number of human beings and mutilate a certain number of cattle, <laughs> and in return, they give the CIA the technology to brainwash the rest of us so we don't see what's going on. Uh, most theories are, uh, paranoid uh, theories are great for horror movies, but if you start taking them seriously, you'll go fucking crazy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I remember you once spoke about owning a Macintosh, so it's a kind of technical question, but you talk about those computer networks. What computer network would you get into if you had a Macintosh computer and modem? Who would you call up and get into if you're news sources? <laughs> That's, uh, I don't have a modem. I've deliberately resisted getting a modem because a friend gave me a pile of computer games and I found after about a month that my productivity as a writer had gone straight down and I was spending so much time with the computer games. So I decided I'm not going to get a modem until my earnings from my writing <laughs> where I can afford to take off a couple of months every year and just play with the modem. <laughs> Yes. Where did you get your source for uh, the Gospel of Christ Mary Magdalene? Um, various Gnostic Gospels and my own perverted imagination. <laughs> yes. And you uh, go to that psychedelics conference at the Claremont Hotel on the 24th? No. I haven't been invited and I got a lot of other work. Yes. May I have a two part question also? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, that's, uh, that's the last question. Actually, it should be easy. Uh, what's Jacques Vallée doing on his compilation of the UFO sightings and whatnot? What, who? Jacques Vallée? Yeah. Uh, uh, any new conclusions? The last I heard, he was convinced that the UFOs are a disinformation system created by an intelligence agency, and that writing about it just made him sound paranoid, so he concentrated on running his computer business and writing a book on how to use computers intelligently and has just given up on the whole UFO thing. Unless something new has happened that I haven't heard about. The second part? Actually, it's related. Um, I was reading in your book recently um, that, uh, that he said, 
uh, he gave in gracefully. They relate in space, time, and ways which we, for which we have at present no concepts. So I was wondering if he had made any advancements or... or no, that was 1976 uh, or 75, maybe. Conversation at a party. Yeah, no, he changed his opinion after Tell that. Us. He changed his opinion quite a bit after that. He decided it was an intelligence agency setting up a simulation of spaceships to hide something else they're doing. Yes. Would you before you I leave? Get going. I know. Would you before you leave in a few sentences tell us why it's more fun to be optimistic than paranoid? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean that's pretty obvious on the face of it. Well, one thing: longevity statistics. Optimists live longer. John Barefoot of Duke University has collected a lot of statistics on that. Optimistic people outlive pessimistic people consistently. If you compare them by sex, by age, by eating habits and diet by lifestyle, by race, by all sorts of things. The optimists live longer. Uh, also, optimists have more fun. And besides, uh, maybe things are going to turn out okay, in which case the pessimists are killing themselves and being miserable for no good reason at all. <laughs> and the final reason is even if everything is going to turn out terribly, the optimists are having more fun before the final tragedy comes, whereas the pessimists are living in misery all the time.